good afternoon and thank you to all of those joining us. Uh, it, it, it's great to be with you and and I'll, I'll just uh, introduce myself again briefly. I'm Danny Canso. I am, uh, as Emily said, the Director of Legislative Strategy and Senior Fiscal Analyst at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. And we are a research and advocacy organization that is based in Atlanta, uh, but looks statewide across Georgia. And, and, and we primarily focus on uh, public policy at the state level, but also uh, have a portfolio that includes certain federal issues uh, when, when, when they um, concern uh, the, the state finances and you know, in, in some of the most impactful areas. Um, and, and so we have a portfolio that ranges from uh, public education to healthcare to tax issues, um, and, and, and while we don't, uh, you know, can't, can't look at everything, um, we try to look at the uh, most significant issues uh, that, that impact the state um, and, and all 11 million Georgians now. Um, and so I want to start in this presentation by going through uh, state revenue trends, uh, what we're looking at, and I'll, I'll cover uh, the, the surplus that we've all um, heard a lot about um, in, in the media. Uh, and, and and kind of try to put into context where we've been, um, the outlook that we see looking forward, um, and then go through uh, the governor's budget proposal um, and, 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 and sort of, you know, how, how that will be considered in the General Assembly, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, the legislative process um, and some of those major highlights in, in the budget that um, I know will affect a lot of folks on the call. So um, just to, to start um, with, with our um, revenues, um, and, 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 you know, I'll just put this in context briefly, the governor of Georgia, uh, the, the major power that that office has is to set the revenue estimate every year. And, and the governor makes that decision unilaterally um, a, as a public policy decision. So it is really fully up to the governor uh, with the advice of the state economist and, you know, of course, all of the resources available to that office to, to make that decision. But what the revenue estimate does, um, in effect, is that it caps the amount of spending that the state can allocate. And so um, at the end of every fiscal year under state law, any surplus that the state has lapses. So it goes into uh, a, a separate account that can't be spent by the governor unilaterally. Um, but the governor does you know, have, that, have that ability to cap what the General Assembly can appropriate. And only the General Assembly can actually allocate funding. Um, so the governor can't do that. Um, but the revenue estimate is a very powerful tool. And we've seen the state have this pattern of setting very conservative revenue estimates. Um, and that is part of what is produced what is the largest surplus that the state has ever had uh, by a long shot. So you can see here, we've had a really volatile uh, four years um, in, in Georgia, um, going on five years when, when we look ahead to next year. Um, so it, it started with in 2019, what was seen then as a little bit of an economic slowdown um, ahead of of course, you know, what ended up being um, the pandemic that had massive effects. Um, but when we look at state revenue, actually, because of the massive federal response, uh, you know, that came in, in 2020 immediately from the pandemic, actually, the effect was to immediately lift state revenue collections, um, you know, actually really substantially. And, and what we saw um, were, you know, really strong corporate tax collections, personal income tax collections, um, and then we saw the impact of inflation. Um, and, and when it comes to state revenues, as, as I'll show you on, on the next slide, most state revenues are collected from personal income taxes. Um, so, the, you know, that, that is a direct flex, reflection of the number of jobs in the state and, and wages. Um, and, and as we see, um, one of the, you know, things behind inflation is, is obviously wages, the job market, um, that that was strongly reflected in, in, in those revenues that we saw um, go up significantly. We also saw that in sales taxes um, as, as people you know had had more money to spend. But what we see in the next two years is the governor actually predicting um, that those revenues are going to fall dramatically. Um, and, and part of that is the governor using that revenue estimating um, capability that that you know is in the um, that office under state law to, to set those revenues conservatively 
um, you know, under um, what would be the premise that we would have increasingly large surpluses, um, you know, and, and, and kind of under that governing philosophy. So you can see here uh, the revenue estimate for the upcoming fiscal year. And in Georgia, the, the fiscal year ranges from July 1st to June 30th. Um, so this would take place uh, July 1st of this year. Um, and, and we kind of chart the trajectory here where actually, you know, just to kind of put into context where the state has been over the last 15 years uh, or so, we, we are still under that per capita spending that we were at in the Great Recession. And that's just kind of a barometer where we have, we've hovered right at that level. We saw that in 2019. Then we saw, you know, a lot of budget cuts in response to the pandemic. And now when we adjust for inflation, um, we're about $400 million below that when, when we look at the $32.5 billion budget that the governor's proposed. So, you know, that that is a very conservative trajectory that the state has taken um, in, in terms of state spending. And, and you can just see here, the purpose of this is to look at where, where the state gets its money. So as I said, about one out of every $2 that the state spends comes from the income tax. Most of that, the personal income tax, uh, and, and then you can see the sales tax is about a quarter of state revenues. And then we have a series of taxes and fees uh, that are about 15%. Um, and, and, and the you know, interesting thing here um, that we flag is that now the state is collecting about $500 million in interest um, because of uh, the amount of revenue that it has in state accounts. So that is a new source of revenue that, that, that's a product of the surpluses essentially. Um, and then the state has, uh, you can see these designated revenue sources that, that constitutionally have to go to certain areas. So all motor fuel tax revenues go to infrastructure, um, you know, primarily state highway and bridges. All lottery funds are dedicated for higher education and pre-K. Uh, and then we have uh, a smaller pool of funds of tobacco settlement funds. Um, and we don't yet see the opioid settlement funds um, in this budget. That's one thing I'll note here um, that has not been put forward yet. Um, but, you know, that, uh, you know, we, we, we see the same media reports where that other states uh, appear to be a little bit ahead of Georgia in allocating that money. Um, but a, a, about $600 million, um, you know, at least is in, in that fund um, to be paid out over about 16 years. But we don't, you know, again, see that here yet. So when we look at the state budget, you know, almost 75% of, of it goes to uh, the cost of education and healthcare. So primarily that goes to education, pre-K through 12th grade education, uh, about 38%. When we add in higher education, uh, that brings uh, it up to more than 50%. Um, and then healthcare, uh, which primarily goes to Medicaid. Um, right now, we have about 2.6 million enrollees in Medicaid. We expect that to go down significantly. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then you can see after that, transportation, that's motor fuel taxes. Um, and, and, and then you can see really um, a, a lot of these areas have remained um, relatively flat over recent years and, and, and are pretty flat in this budget um, outside of pay raises. Um, and you can see, you know, about 30 agencies um, make up just 4% of state spending um, in, in, in what we just have as general government there. So um, most, most of what the state does um, go, goes to uh, education and healthcare. And, and, and so uh, I kind of want to, you know, preface talking a little bit more um, about what we see with, uh, you know, another, the, the best source of data that we have right now for the economic outlook uh, in the year ahead. And so, um, you know, what we've seen actually in, in, in the last week or so um, is the initial data for the last quarter of last year that puts, uh, you know, national growth at about two and a half percent. And and actually, even though, uh, most economists are still forecasting a recession in the year ahead. Um, in Georgia, uh, the economy is expected to hold up um, significantly, you know, better than our national counterparts. Um, and and so, uh, the University of Georgia in the Terry Business School has the Seelig Center for Economic Growth, and they put out the first comprehensive um, economic outlook of the year. So. 
these numbers are taken um, from their projections um, and, you know, have remained kind of one of our state's strongest sources of data uh, that lawmakers rely on as well. Um, and so what they project is for inflation um, to settle out in, in the midpoint of the year uh, around 3%. Um, and, and, you know, kind of what we've seen um, largely because of the, the spike in interest rates, um, as well as things settling down in the supply chain um, after the pandemic is, you know, inflation kind of trending um, in that direction. We're not yet at 3%, you know, we're closer um, to 4.5%. Um, initial kind of data shows us, but that is where they, they forecast uh, inflation settling out around 3% for 2023, which would, you know, be a welcome change. Um, and on top of that, you know, personal consumption numbers um, to relative to inflation to decrease a little bit. So to grow at 2%, um, but, you know, that would be a net decrease of 1%. And then for personal income to rise slightly um, and, and kind of, you know, the, the, the support for that is uh, what we've seen in recent years in the labor market. It's been really difficult to hire um, and, and we've seen a lot of competition there. And so with a recession where we don't see any major industries, you know, really suffering. I mean, we see layoffs in, in kind of tech industries. Um, we see the housing market, um, which, which has already been in recession in Georgia, um, primarily because of that rapid rise in interest rates by the Federal Reserve. Um, but we don't see the type of weakness um, in, in major sectors of the economy that we've seen in previous recessions. And so what that means in terms of the forecast is that basically Georgia's economy is expected to perform in kind of a flat way, where we're actually, you know, expecting to see growth around 3% um, that, that will be eaten up in a lot of ways by inflation, um, but where nationally there's expected to be, you know, the, the, this mild recession that is caused by um, the, the Federal Reserve in a lot of ways, um, trying to tamp down um, inflation by by have you know having this rapid rise in interest rates that has a consequence across the economy. You know it has that in the technology sector, which in Georgia um, is an important area. Um, you know certainly in Atlanta, um, in fintech, in the metro area. Um, but we 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 do um, expect to see um, you know a, a, a relatively strong performance given um, you know what in earlier forecast was. Uh, we're expected to be, um, you know, kind of a, 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 a worse outlook. Um, and so now, you know, when, when we combine that relatively conservative trajectory of state spending, um, which, which actually over the last three years would be below the rate of inflation, um, what we also have simultaneously are increasingly large reserves. So in Georgia law, the revenue shortfall reserve has traditionally been where surplus funds go. So at the end of every year, any funds that were not spent by the state would go in the revenue shortfall reserve, uh, but that account has a maximum level of 15% of prior year revenues. So in 2011, the state raised uh, the maximum of the revenue shortfall reserve from 10% to 15%. Uh, but as you can see from this chart, uh, th that account was really depleted in the Great Recession uh, between 2008 and uh, 2011, um, where, where we kind of ticked it down to just about $100 million from $2.5 billion. And then the state leaders kind of said, we're going to try to build that back to a higher level of 15%, which we had never reached uh, before. Um, and, and as you can see here, on average, the state added about $350 million to that reserve account uh, between 2011 and 2019. And then what we saw during the pandemic when state revenue spiked is that the state preemptively implemented really deep across the board budget cuts of 10%. And the year before in 2019, the state eliminated uh, most vacant positions across state agencies. And those, in a lot of cases, were a product of really low salaries uh, and a lot of attrition over the 10 years that followed the Great Recession. So that was kind of the backdrop where we had state government that was operating really conservatively, but we had revenues increase dramatically during the pandemic 
um, partly because of the federal response to the pandemic and partly because of inflation that affected consumer spending levels through the sales tax and that affected wages um, and jobs numbers through the income tax. Um, so that combined to the state having um, you know, significantly more revenues. And then we saw for the first time the state having just revenues on top of the full revenue shortfall reserve. Um, and, and that number has grown now to about $7 billion. So in total, between those accounts, the state has about $12 billion on hand, um, which again, you know, is really unprecedented. And then the lottery, um, all of those revenues are reserved for lottery spending. So we've seen uh, spending for higher education, uh, which is primarily through the HOPE scholarship and, and for pre-K um, continue to stay under the level uh, of lottery collections. And we've also seen lottery collections go up. And, and one answer to that um, is that in this budget, we see the state now moving up what it's paying for the HOPE scholarship uh, by about 10%, going from 90% of tuition to 100% of tuition costs across the board. So that's going. To, that's one answer. Um, but you can see, you know, that the lottery reserves are a separate account, but that is the next largest where the state has uh, about $2 billion there that could also be used, um, but only for either pre-K or higher education. So the, the picture this paints, though, is that th there are a lot of resources that are available um, that, that are still largely untapped. And what we see in the governor's budget proposal is, is only to use uh, about $2 billion uh, of, of those for refunds, but to, to maintain most of those uh, funds in the account, and then obviously to set a, a really low revenue estimate. So um, one area on top of that, um, that, that folks also see that um, the governor maintains strong control over uh, is debt, the, the use of bond debt. So under the constitution of Georgia, the state can issue about 10% of debt a year. Um, and, and what we've seen uh, in kind of, you know, prior years is that hovering between 6% and 8%. Um, and, and in more recent years, we've seen that fall below 5%. Um, and, and that can make a big difference when it comes to things like school buses, um, and, and other long-term purchases that the state makes. So that's an area um, that we flag particularly related to student transportation, where we've seen the, the state-funded share fall from over 50% in the 1990s uh, now to just about 20%. Um, and, and school bus costs each year are about $1.1 .1 billion cost now um, when, when we look at all costs for uh, public school transportation. Um, in K through 12 schools. So, you know, that, that that's an area where we continue to advocate um, for greater use uh, of, of, of the state's bond capacity there. Um, you know, but but again, um, that, that that's another area where we have a lot of room in this budget. Um, another major area when, when we're looking at kind of, you know, what has changed um, in this fiscal year um, is the costs of providing insurance through the state health benefit plan. And this is a really massive spike uh, that has not yet been resolved. And that if if kind of left the way that it is in the executive budget is going to have uh, really significant impacts for cities and counties across Georgia through their local school districts. So the, the state operates uh, what's called the state health benefit plan. And that is how uh, employees get access to health coverage um, because of the, the, the very large number of people that you know, are, are enrolled through state government. Um, and, and it's also offered to uh, school employees um, across the state as well. So um, you know, because of that large pool of people, it, it makes sense for the state to operate um, its own health benefit plan. Um, but we've, what we've seen is that the, the cost for the employer share of that plan, which is either paid by the state or local school districts, um, has remained constant since 2014. Um, and this year, the state is proposing a 67% increase in that contribution rate. And that has to be paid by the employer. So again, that's either state government or local districts uh, through city, cities and counties and school districts. Um, and, and what we see in the governor's budget 
is the state is proposing to shift the, that cost down uh, for about 98,000 employees to the local level. So we estimate that that would be uh, $745 million per year in additional costs that local school districts would have to uncover, uh, would have to cover it, it, if those funds are not um, added in by the General Assembly through the budget process. Um, and, and you can see here how that's broken down. Um, for, for most of these costs, they're going to come from uh, people who are called classified employees. Those are school bus drivers, cafeteria workers, uh, janitors, you know, often the lowest paid employees in the school uh, that, that are primarily paid with local and federal dollars. Um, and, and, you know, even though they get the state health benefit plan, uh, the state is proposing to raise the cost that school districts have have to pay um, to provide that coverage to those employees. So for every employee, uh, the, the increase that's proposed would be equivalent to $7,200 a year. So, you know, that means if a school district wants to hire a new teacher, um, it would cost $7,200 a year more to do that. If they want to hire a new paraprofessional, you know, same thing a new janitor, a new cafeteria worker, anything, um, because they offer them as a, you know, benefit for, for having that job, access to the state health benefit plan. And, and that cost um, would go up um, to $1,580 a month, um, essentially. So this is a really big deal. Um, it, it's a lot of money. It's the sharpest increase um, that, that we've, you know, certainly seen in modern history. Um, and, and, you know, is really unprecedented in that way. And so it is um, already an area of significant debate, um, but, but, you know, I, I think um, will we'll be more um, of a focal point as the legislative session goes on, um, and is certainly something that, that we're deeply engaged in um, because of, you know, how significant this change is. And so I know that um, there, there are probably a lot of questions on that, and, and, and we will have some discussion um, as we continue um, through the presentation. Um, and, and so now to turn to the other major issue in the uh, budget, uh, Medicaid. Um, so we have two really big things happening um, in, in, in this budget. The first um, is, is, is happening no matter what, and that is uh, a broad redetermination of all uh, eligible Medicaid enrollees. Um, and, and the reason for that is because of the unwinding of the public health emergency um, and the enhancements in Medicaid that we've seen through the pandemic. Um, so so what, what we've seen, you know, under the federal rules that were finalized last year um, is that the state will have a period uh, of 12 months beginning in April to redetermine the eligibility uh, of everyone who's on Medicaid. And right now, that is about 2.7 million Georgians. We've seen a really significant spike in that enrollment number uh, because of what was called continuous coverage, where the state was incentivized through a higher than normal um, rate of payment from the federal government to keep anyone who is enrolled in Medicaid continuously cover it, covered throughout the duration of the public health emergency. Uh, but that is now expiring. So that, that means two things. Our state's FMAP rate, which is the amount that is paid by the federal government, is going down. Um, it's going down from 72% to around 66%. And at the same time, as the state redetermines eligibility, um, you know, if, if that is done in a way that, you know, is not optimal, um, that could mean a loss of coverage just due to process reasons, people move and change address, um, you know, primarily our Medicaid population still in Georgia is women, children, and, and those who are disabled. Um, and, and so, um, but we, we do see um, a, a, a significant number that we estimate to be um, around 500,000 people um, that for eligibility reasons um, are likely to lose coverage through that determination. Um, so that would mean our, our Medicaid enrollment going down from around 2.7 million, 2.6 million to around 2.1 million um, Georgians, um, you know, which, which is a sharp drop. So at the same time that that's happening, uh, the state is proposing to continue on with uh, the pathways waiver that was approved by the General Assembly in 2019, and that is uh, a, a signature priority of Governor Kemp's. 
And so essentially, because of that broader eligibility redetermination that is happening at the same time that the state is seeking to uh, implement this really limited expansion um, in eligibility, um, there are shifting estimates in the number of people who would be eligible for uh, Medicaid under, under that plan. So basically what it is is um, expanding eligibility to up to 100% of the federal poverty level while also requiring um, work requirements um, and certain cost sharing requirements um, in terms of premiums. So from that, the, the eligibility um, still goes down, you know, is, is very restricted, um, but, but we see sort of three scenarios that, that we've projected out here. So uh, the state under this plan still pays the regular Medicaid match rate, which is 66%. Um, and that means an estimated cost of about $2,500 per enrollee. So the, the scenario that we see now described is around 100,000 eligible enrollees. Uh, and that would be a cost of about $250 million. Um, and, and, and we, of course, at GBPI advocate for full Medicaid expansion uh, for a variety of reasons, because of the health benefits, uh, because of just you know, fiscal reasons. And, and you can kind of see why here in this chart, where under full Medicaid expansion, we estimate that about 500,000 uh, Georgians would be eligible for enrollment um, in, in the first year, and that that would cost around $240 million. So that, as you can see here, is less than um, the uh, cost to ensure about 100,000 Georgians under this waiver. Um, and, and, and you can also see kind of in the notes that we also, um, you know, that, that's not including about $700 million in incentives that the state would get over a two-year period uh, through an enhanced Medicaid match that would be applied throughout the Medicaid program. Um, and so, you know, that just um, based off the numbers here, um, you can see why uh, there, there's kind of a renewed debate over Medicaid expansion, uh, because that could also uh, potentially save the state uh, money while covering uh, hundreds of thousands of people who otherwise would not have health coverage and who may actually lose health coverage who have it right now through Medicaid because of the uh, redetermination and the exp expiration of the public health emergency. Um, so another really significant area that we look at at GBPI and kind of have tracked from year to year is the broader employment across state government. Um, so this is across the executive branch. So about 30 agencies, um, also including the technical college system. Um, and what we see now are some really concerning numbers. We see that annual turnover system-wide has exceeded 25% um, and follows a six-year trend of 20% of a year, um, which you can imagine um, has really left the state workforce um, you know, with, with a lot of holes. Um, and, and among full-time employees, that turnover rate is actually about 29%. Um, and, and while that is occurring, we've seen the number of applicants fall to an all-time low um, over the last fiscal year. And um, kind of in response to that, the state has proposed um, these two pay increases. So last year, there was a $5,000 across the board pay increase. And this year, there's a uh, $2,000 proposed pay increase. But what, what that equates to um, is, you know, what would be a starting salary of about $36,000 a year um, and a median salary of about $47,000 a year. Um, and across a lot of these areas, when we look at agencies like the Department of Community Health, uh, the Department of Behavioral Health, uh, many of those starting salaries are in the high 20s or low 30s um, for, for really critical positions. Uh, and, and so, you know, simply put, agencies are not able to attract people um, because they're offering salaries that are way below what those applicants could get in, in the private sector, in the market. And they're also um, asking a lot from their workforce that has um, shrunk by about 30% um, over the last 15 years, um, down from about 83,000 full-time employees to about 60,000 um, since 2008. So. Um, State agencies still have a, lo a lot of big holes to address. Um, you know, those pay increases are positive, um, but, but we 
um, you know, certainly think that there is a big role for the General Assembly um, to look at those different agency levels, particularly uh, for agencies like the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, um, where, you know, there, there's increasing legislative interest, certainly in addressing um, things like mental health, um, substance abuse, um, addiction, um, and, and, and a variety of things like that, but where uh, the agency, um, you know, is now in a lot of ways relying on contractors um, because they just simply can't find the staff uh, to perform their perform their core functions. So, uh, you know, that, that 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 I know is a big area of concern for folks on this call, and something I'm sure um, you know that many of you run into in your interactions with those agencies. So. You know, I, I know there's a lot to cover when we talk about uh, the, the the budgets, but just a few um, changes, you know, that that, that we um, tracked and, and some of the biggest things here. Um, as I said, about $2 billion um, in these one-time rebates. So a billion dollars to match what was done uh, in the 2022 budget uh, for these, you know, refunds of $250 and $500, about $1.1 billion uh, for this new one-time homestead exemption. And basically it would be um, asking local governments to deliver a homestead exemption equivalent to $20,000 on the assessed value of, of, of a home. And it has to be a primary home. But, but the contradiction here is that at the same time, uh, the state is asking local districts um, to find a recurring $250 million um, to pay for the increased costs under the state health benefit plan. So, um, you know, those are two kind of opposite things where we know that school districts get their primary source of revenue from the property tax. Um, and, and, and that is why uh, that, that measure, you know, is the subject of a lot of debate right now. Um, there are about $156 million in one-time grants uh, for K through 12 schools. They're kind of a, a variety of things that those are categorized in, um, you know, that also um, puts that in the hands of the General Assembly um, a, a, as they uh, rewrite the budgets. And then that $2,000 uh, pay raise that we see across the board. And that's also applied to teachers. Um, but in this budget, it's actually effective September 1st, which lowers the value about, by about $400 a year. Um, and, and, and is, you know, kind of a, a little bit of a budget trick that we see sometimes um, that, that, that also passes more costs down uh, to the local level. Um, and, and one thing to note is when there are these uh, teacher pay increases, um, those are only going to certified uh, teachers paid with state dollars. So within a school, there are teachers paid with local and federal dollars as well. Um, and local school districts have to find those uh, resources elsewhere um, if they want to provide that um, across the school. So often that can um, sort of double the cost of um, those uh, pay raises, or at least add, um, you know, depending on um, the, the, the situation at individual schools, um, you know, and, and, and the number of staff that they, you know, how, how they're balancing their staff. Um, so one of the really positive things here that I mentioned that we see is about $61 million to uh, go back um, to, to the way that the HOPE scholarship operated pre-2012 um, and fund up to 100% of tuition. Um, it was at 90% in previous years. Um, and, and so that is across uh, both technical colleges and the university system. It does not apply to private um, schools in Georgia, um, however. So you also see uh, about 250 uh, new slots for now comp waivers, um, annualizing about 500 slots that were added in the previous year's budget. Uh, we, according to the best estimates that we have, about 7,000 people are on waiting lists for those waivers right now. Um, what we hear is that some of those um, are not yet eligible uh, because you have to be over 21 years old, um, but the state, you know, does not kind of clearly produce those numbers, and we're hoping that there will be more clarity, but certainly there is a huge amount of unmet need there, um, and also, you know, a, a real um, deficit in provider capacity. So those slots are funded by the state, 
Um, but it's important to note that you know when when, when that happens, um, they also have to find a provider that will provide care. Um, and you know, I, I think as many folks here know, um, so you know that that comes with a discussion of reimbursement rates um, and also of the broader Medicaid program. But right now. Um, we see about 250 slots created. And, and this also comes after a study committee met um, you know, bipartisan between the House and Senate led by uh, Senators Harrell and Albers. Um, and what they recommended were 2,400 slots to be created. Um, so this is uh, an area of priority, I know for a lot of uh, organizations um, here and also for um, you know, members of the General Assembly as well. So this is an area that that, that, that we, you know, prioritize as well um, and, and hope to see um, expanded. Um, and then about $4 million here to, to conduct that process of redetermination. That's going to be done through the Department um, of uh, Health, uh, of Human Services, um, and, and so, you know, that's going to be a really big challenge for uh, an agency that already um, has uh, very broad staffing challenges um, and, and has, you know, had challenges attracting caseworkers um, in the past to be able to put together a staff for that redetermination that will start um, in just a couple of months now. Um, and then we see about $52 million for um, the governor's waiver proposal um, that was covered about $300 million because of that falling um, federal rate for Medicaid, um, and then just about $23 million to uh, purchase school buses statewide. Um, so I know that, um, you know, we, we, we covered a lot of things um, that are very broad here. Um, we, we try to take a, um, you know, high level look at, at, at the budget. I also will flag that we have our annual budget overview that's available. Um, where you can get more information on all the things I've talked about and more. Um, and, and so we'll make sure that that's available for everybody. Um, and then just kind of conclude by saying that, um, you know, a, a, a few words on the budget process. Um, and so in Georgia, the annual budget process really, uh, you know, as the General Assembly convenes, begins with the governor introducing his executive budget. And so that has to happen within five days of the General Assembly convening, and that also provides the revenue estimate. So that, you know, is, is the framework that the General Assembly now has to work within um, as, as they um, write these budgets. And, and, and you know, certainly um, they can push back to the governor, they can uh, approve measures that, um, you know, would, would sort of ask him to raise the revenue estimate um, but that is the framework that the General Assembly works within. So it starts um, with the joint appropriations hearings that we saw um, happen uh, a couple of weeks ago um, and recently conclude. And now um, we see the General Assembly um, in the House beginning work on the AFY 2023 budget, um, which takes us through June 30th of this year. So that's the amended budget where um, some of these tax rebates um, are, are located where things like those uh, school grants are. Um, and, and so that is the first budget that the General Assembly is going to consider. Um, they, they kind of go sequentially um, and, and they will pass that um, earlier because obviously it's, it, it's for the current year, so it's more pressing. Um, and then um, the House will take up the FY 2024 budget, which is the full year budget um, where um, you know the, these broader changes um, are in most cases. Um, and, and so that budget process starts in the House, then the Senate will um, consider their version of the budget, and then they will come together through uh, what's called a conference committee with three representatives from each chamber um, to approve the final budget that will go to the governor. And then the governor also has line item veto authority. So the governor has 40 days uh, after the General Assembly sends the budget to uh, both sign it and to make uh, individual vetoes um, on, on line item areas. Um, and, and so that is the budget process. So there's a lot of room um, for the General Assembly. Again, all appropriations decisions um, are, are made by the General Assembly. Um, and, and so we're, we're hopeful um, that there is room to consider 
um, a lot of additions because, you know, just, just to, um, you know, be a, a little bit more straightforward, uh, we have billions of dollars in surplus funds that, that we are not allocating, that, that we see um, nowhere in, in this budget. Um, and, and so even as we know that, um, you know, there are tremendous challenges facing the state, and that could be a, a, a really good opportunity um, to, to address those issues, um, you know, not only do we see the state holding on to those surplus funds, but we also see these really conservative revenue estimates um, that are likely to produce surpluses in the current year and next year. Um, and, and so, you know, it is um, certainly worth continuing to elevate those issues because we know that the state has an unprecedented level of resources on hand, um, you know, and, and, and the more attention, I think, uh, that we can get to these issues and that we can get in front of lawmakers, uh, hopefully we can um, encourage and continue to build support to take action. Excellent. So we've, I, I want to circle back to some questions around, uh, no surprise here, around the uh, insurance adjustment costs. Uh, but before we get into those, uh, I want to ask quickly, um, what, tell us about GBPI, um, how can we support this work? What are the things that you all are zeroing in on um, in this session under the Gold Dome and what are the ways that we may be able to engage with that or support that? Yeah, absolutely. And I only touched on, you know, a fraction of the work that we do at GBPI. So encourage everyone, you know, go to gbpi.org. Um, there's a way for you to sign up for whatever you're interested in across the policy areas that we cover. Uh, we have experts dedicated to K through 12 education, uh, pre-K and higher education, um, human services and economic opportunity, uh, who look at immigration um, as well, um, and, and you know, other things um, across the state budget. I um, specialize in uh, tax policy, uh, as well as kind of the, the, the broader um, budget trends and, and, and process. Um, and, and then we are all um, you know, significantly engaged in the legislative process as well. So even though we at GBPI are nonpartisan, um, we are an advocacy organization in that we advocate for um, the, the priorities that we put forward across these areas based off of, you know, a, a pretty rigorous process of research, um, you know, and, and also being informed by um, the environment in Georgia and, and, and sort of um, the, the ecosystem that we operate in. So um, you can see our uh, legislative priorities um, as, as well. And, and, and we try to, um, in some ways, you know, democratize the, the, the policymaking process where we can. Um, there too, we're also um, always advocating for transparency um, and, and trying to um, alert folks when opportunities um, are available and when, you know, major bills are under consideration um, that, that would affect these um, issues or, you know, have, have have really broad implications. But, you know, I'll, I'll just say um, that right now, this year, we're, we, we've seen more turnover um, than in recent history in, in the state, um, in, in the General Assembly, in the legislature, um, and at the state level. And so it is a really good opportunity for folks to get involved um, and, and, and to you know, keep an eye on the General Assembly and the legislature um, as a lens in your work, um, where we see a new speaker of the House, um, new folks all across the House of Representatives in different committee slots. Um, and, and in Georgia, we do have a two-year legislative session. So when a bill is introduced, it's active uh, for the next two years. Um, until the end of session 2024. Um, and then we also have a new lieutenant governor and a new leadership slate all across the Senate. Um, and, and so those leaders, um, you know, there, there are some folks who are um, constant in that mix, you know, who've been around before, uh, but by and large um, among both rank and file members where um, there, there's turnover um, of about a quarter of the General Assembly, um, if not a little bit more, uh, we also see a lot of turnover among those leaders. Um, you know, of course, the, you know, Governor Kemp in, is going into his second term, um, you know, which is also um, 
a transition there. Um, and, and we also have a new lieutenant governor. So um, there is a lot of room for advocacy, a lot of new faces. Uh, we know that we have to do a lot of education um, on, on basic issues, on, um, you know, kind of um, the, the, the things that we're dedicated to um, and, and in trying to address problems that have been around for a long time. You know, that is one of the unfortunate things that we have um, in, in Georgia just as a consequence of um, the, the history that we've had over the last 15 years is there are a lot of unsolved problems. Um, and now we have a lot of new leaders who, who in many cases um, are not aware of those issues um, and, and may be inclined to um, address things that have not been addressed for um, you know, that period. So um, we're hopeful. <laughs> we're, we're definitely optimistic there. But the state budget um, touches everything essentially. I mean, it, it it really is comprehensive. I mean, there there are things like what we've talked about on on low income housing, um, where there are limitations under the Constitution, um, and and that's why um, you know I'd encourage folks to to you know pay attention to tax policy too, because that is the other side of the coin, um, and and there are a lot of resources that we dedicate through the tax system, um, but we so you know the short answer is you know follow us at GBPI. Um, that we, we do have overviews across um, many of these other areas and, and, and you'll be able to um, navigate those. Um, and, and hopefully we can send out the budget overview in addition to this presentation for folks to see too. Um, on one of those last slides for um, the major budget changes, one point of uh, clarification, uh, we mentioned that there were 3.8 million going to DCH for additional caseworkers. Is that additional funding or is that 3.8 the funding yeah so that is state funds so because we get um the, the federal share for the program um, they pay 66 percent of the costs so the state only has to pay um, about 34 percent of, of of those salaries so it's still not um as high of a salary you know as as we would suggest is is probably necessary um, you know, given the importance of that role, um, but it is three time, you know, it, it is in the low 30s. Um, that was, and that was the quick math was, oh, wait a minute, that's <laughs> not quite, quite even a salary. Um, so that's, that's a good, good thing to keep in mind. And that's probably, I would imagine, true for other pieces of the budget as well, that this, the state is, um, there's subsidies there that the funding is coming from other places and the state agency is just a piece of that. Particularly, right, particularly when we talk about Medicaid, um, you know, al almost always there, we're, we're just considering the state share. Okay, great. So we have a number of nonprofits, no surprise here, that touch on uh, or work with uh, education. And so we have a lot of questions and follow-ups about uh, the changes to uh, the insurance. And then as that relates to the $2,000 pay increase for teachers that the governor recently uh, recently announced. So I'm gonna start run through these and if I miss any folks, I apologize, drop it back in the chat for me. Um, are there positions, so 98,000 uh, of school employees are not included, it said in that budget. So are is there, how, what is the math to that? Are there certain positions that aren't included in that insurance change? Um, is it by county? How is that formulated or determined broadly? Yeah, so school funding is a unfortunately complex formula. And so the state in reality pays for um, about half of um, the, the, the funding um, that, that goes to the school. Um, you know, so so in real so what that means is that within the school, certain employees are paid with state dollars and certain employees are paid with local and federal dollars. And only, you know, the people behind the budget know who those are. You know, you don't really, you wouldn't say, I'm a teacher paid with local dollars, I'm a teacher paid with state dollars, you know, same thing for other positions. Um, but that's just the breakdown. And then different schools make decisions for things like class sizes, where they may bring on um, additional employees, you know, with based off of the decisions of those local leaders, how high they want property taxes to be, things like that, um, you know, that, that shape the decisions within the school. Um, but so the state is only paying for that, even though it's through the 
state health benefit plan, which is operated by the state. And all of those teachers as a benefit of being a teacher are offered access to get their health insurance through the state health benefit plan, which tends to be, um, you know, in a lot of cases, I think um, something that, you know, is, is seen as kind of a perk. Um, they're, the employer share is the same. That, that's how they do it actuarially. So for all of those employees that the school has, um, they're going to have to pay the same employer share um, to give them health care. And, and what the governor's budget does is only includes 111,000 certified employees um, in, in the ones who are getting that. So there are in schools generally two categories beyond that. It's certified, um, mostly teachers, and then classified um, who are the other employees, who are the you know cafeteria workers, janitors, those folks. Um, and so a good number of those are paid with state dollars, but the state isn't even including those um, in, in this budget. They're asking local districts to cover um, this whole broad range of 98,000 employees. So, um, you know, that's something to keep in mind is um, in addition to the proposed premium increase, which is a policy decision in itself, you know, going from $945 to $1,580 um, is not something that is exact math. I mean, that's something that is a policy proposal that is being put forward and doing that all in one year, um, again, you know, is, is, is really unprecedented. Um, but so that decision, and then the decision of how many employees does the state cover, how many employees are local districts asked to cover um, is another policy decision where the state right now is taking a very conservative position that they're only going to pay for certified um, state paid employees um, and, and everyone else is going to be up to local school districts. Um, and, and then on top of that, local school districts have the proposed $2,000 pay increase. And so that money is only allocated for state paid certified educators. So if the school wants to say we're going to apply this pay increase more broadly, we want to give it to the lowest paid people in the school as well, they're going to have to come up with the money to do that. And then they would also have to come up with the money um, to pay the uh, other certified employees who are paid with other dollars, uh, you know, which is just going to vary from district to district. Um, and, and then um, it's also the fact that the state budget starts this in September uh, when their fiscal year starts in July. Um, so that's two months more that they have to cover. Um, so all of these costs just add up, you know, and, and that's why it's not necessarily a guarantee that um, they pass on those pay increases at all. Um, you know, and they, they also may propose things like property tax increases locally. Um, and, and that's something that folks might see as well. I do actually want to mention something here too. I think in our uh, planning, you mentioned that there hasn't been an increase to the premium, uh, or at least as it's passed on to the employer and the employee since 2014 for the state insurance plan. So maybe let's start there. If, if you want to clarify that piece, um, and then I'll I'll ask the second question. That's right. So, um, you know, the easiest way to understand this is is just the the cost. So it from 2014, um, you know, to to the present, it was $945 a month. Um, and, and then that cost went up to $1,585. That, that's the proposed cost um, going forward. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a uh, it, it's kind of the challenge of a state health managed you know benefit, um, which is that sometimes political decisions um, mix with actuarial decisions of the actual costs to sustain a program, um, and and that could be how you end up with. Um, you know, instances like we have now where in one year we say we're going to raise the cost by 67%. Um, you know, that is not um, a usual thing. But, you know, as folks see with your own health premium plans and, you know, healthcare plans and different costs, there are year to year increases, um, you know, and, and the state was able to avoid those um, for a long time. And then we had the very unusual pandemic period um, that completely changed health. Um, spending and decisions and uh, funding. Um, and now, 
you know, I think the consequences of those things um, have caught up to us in a way. Um, but I think it's also a question of how much responsibility does the state take for that um, in picking up the costs? Um, because that is a policy decision. You know, the, the amount that the state charges um, as the employer contribution per employee is a decision that the state makes. Um, and so, you know, the members of the General Assembly um, can impact that decision. They, they, they can say, you know, we, we want to do something different. We want to either um, accept this increase, but we're going to um, find state funds to help cover it, or we want to apply it to, you know, a, a higher number of employees, or we think that this is too large of an increase and we need to dig deeper into why this is necessary. Um, you know, and we haven't completely seen that um, in, in terms of the, the information presented to the public. Um, so, you know, I mean, we're definitely going to dig deeper in this, but this is a huge issue. This is a huge issue at both the state and local level um, and would certainly encourage those um, you know, who it makes sense, you know, with, with the work that you're doing um, to, to in, engage in this too, uh, because local leaders found out about this earlier this month. Um, so this, this was new to a lot of people um, and, and they're still trying to figure out, you know, how to make sense of it. Um, and advocacy at the local level is going to play, I think, a big role um, in, in helping to motivate lawmakers um, to, to understand the significance of this issue, because we are in a really unusual environment right now where the state has a lot of resources. And there's also the impression that local governments have received, you know, resources federally and otherwise to um, school systems and others. And, you know, in, in a lot of cases um, that, you know, it varies, it's, um, but, but, um, certainly we, we hear uh, from school systems on the ground that, um, you know, this is going to be a really big financial burden. Uh, and, and there are a lot of areas that just don't have the capacity to absorb this big of a change without having to make cuts uh, in, in other areas. And then when we look broadly and we see things like transportation costs, which is, have been frozen, and that's why local districts um, you know, have, have, have picked up a greater share um, and, and the state's contribution has remained basically flat for um, more than 20 years. Um, and, and so there are just a variety of pressures on um, local districts. Um, you know, Absolutely. And, and, but this is one that's, you know, very tangible. Absolutely. And I always consider how our, you know, nonprofits typically fill in the gaps. And so anytime there's shifting locally or nationally or statewide, um, that that absolutely shifts the work that uh, nonprofits are are looking to do and what their outlook is for the year as well. Um, I th think we've gotten to as much as we can. I know we're coming up on time. Um, this is this is more of a what's what's your take on this uh, based on your vast wealth and depth of knowledge here. Um, we touched on it a little before, but the Medicaid expansion. This year, is it likely that next year, are we going to keep pushing it off until the next cycle? Yeah, I mean, uh, we definitely have not heard uh, support for Medicaid expansion from the governor, uh, the speaker of the house or the lieutenant governor, but we know just the math right now, if, if, if truly, you know, we're able to implement the pathways program, uh, which is still pending. You know, they're, the state still has has a lot of work to do to stand that up, but they are saying that their goal is to uh, get it effective July 1st, um, you know, which which certainly would be very difficult, but we will be watching um, and, and there will be public comment and, and other things before it would be allowed to take effect. But if, if we say that, you know, the, the projection that we've heard from the Department of Community Health about 100,000 people would be covered, that's more expensive than the cost to give the same Medicaid coverage to 500,000 people. So it just doesn't make sense that we would tell those 400,000 people, you know, we're already paying enough to where it, it, it wouldn't make a difference and it would actually save us money um, to give you health coverage. Um, even though we know there are challenges with Medicaid, we, you know, we know that the reimbursement rate needs work, that we need to do other things for providers, but just at a basic level, 39 other states um, have realized that there's, there's great value here 
Um, and so we're hopeful. I mean, we the issue isn't going away, um, you know, and, uh, until it's addressed, unfortunately. And under the law, um, there is a coverage gap, you know, that that is just not addressed. Um, where if if you're between 100 and 138 percent of the federal poverty level, you have no option. You have no way um, to get health care if you know if you can't get it through your employer. Um, and and for those below, you know, we know that um, in in the design we're anticipating excluding um, you know more than 200,000 people who are who are making wages you know below the federal poverty level, um, which for you know, an individual um, is about $13,000 a year, you know, for a family of four, really low, um, you know, and that's who we're talking about. And as I will remind us all, as you did earlier, uh, we had some changes in this last election, we had some turnover and some positions. And so uh, if there's ever a time to reactivate some energy, uh, this seems like a fairly good one. Um, and so if nothing else, there is hope in that, that with new, new leaders and new direction come potentially new priorities. Uh, Danny, I want to thank you so much for your time today. We did end up needing almost our full 90 folks. So thank you to those who stayed on. Um, Danny, thank you again so much. Um, I know this is just incredibly helpful uh, for our nonprofits as they look to navigate this year and into next year. And of course, it will all turn over again. So we hope that we will see you all in the audience and you as well, Danny, uh, and GBPI this time next year, but let's not go that long without uh, connecting with, with the work of GBPI folks. Uh, thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful afternoon and we will see you next time. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.